Today we're in Matthew 18. We're going to look at verses 15 through 20. And uh, I'll read beginning at verse 15. Read to verse 20. We'll get into our study. What we're looking at today, and you'll see this as we go through this passage, is related to dealing with conflict in a, in a church between believers. And so I chose to entitle this particular installment of our study of Matthew, Protecting Unity. But if you had a subtitle, it really is relating to, in terms of the, the doctrine, the theology that it pertains to, it's really relating to what is called church discipline. You'll see that as we get into this study. But let's begin reading in Matthew 18 at verse 15. I'll read to verse 20, we'll get into our study. Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 15, Jesus says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, hit him in the head. No, but if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Let me begin by simply pointing out something that's obvious, and yet it doesn't seem to be as obvious as it would at first appear, and that is this. When Jesus in verses 19 and 20 speaks concerning agreement, when he says, for example, I say to you that if uh, two of you agree on earth concerning anything, when you look at verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Let's remember the context. A lot of times people will use these verses out of context. And so they'll use them for, for um, encouragement to pray. I see it all the time. But Jesus is not speaking concerning agreeing in prayer. The context of this is dealing with disorder in the church. And what Jesus is saying here is when the church leadership gets together to adjudicate a problem, he is the one who has overseen that uh, elder and, and uh, member of the church kind of uh, working together, and he is the one who is present in the uh, bringing peace. And so this is dealing with church discipline. Again, a lot of times you'll, you'll have somebody on, on Facebook saying, you know, well, Let's pray wherever two or more agree. Well, the context of that is related to dealing with conflict in the church. And that's what we're going to look at today, protecting unity. And I have to begin by saying to you that one of the joys of and the responsibilities of teaching the Word of God from uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, from book to book, is that you cover the entire counsel of God. And what we're going to deal with today is something that I normally would not simply wake up and on a Monday and say, okay, Lord, what can we speak about next week? What can I say that, that I really want to speak on? And, and then, oh, yes, let's talk about church discipline. What a great subject. It's a difficult subject to deal with. And uh, you'll see why in just a moment as we look at it. You see, this particular topic isn't one that is uh, necessarily taught in the average church service. And, and that is because the average church isn't teaching through the Bible verse by verse. But that's how you learn the instructions of Christ. That's how you learn to live lives that are pleasing to God. It's by going verse by verse. You see, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus was giving what is called the Great Commission. And he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus said, teach them everything I commanded you. And so that's what we attempt to do. We attempt to go through the, the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so we get the entire counsel of God. And that's what we're doing here in the Gospel of Matthew as we've come to this particular portion of Scripture. 
We're going into a portion of Scripture that deals with protecting unity, dealing with disorder. But that is a foreign concept today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lay a foundation, a prolonged introduction, in order that we might be able to see the context and understand the purpose of this passage. So I'll begin by saying the church is made up of people, and because the church is made up of people, conflict with others is inevitable. So you have a church family, and it is inevitable that you will, the more you're involved, the more you will have opportunity to have conflict with somebody else. It just happens. And I've discovered that for many Christians, the easiest way for them to deal with friction and disagreement is to simply leave. And so rather than dealing with the problem, they just leave and take the problem with them. And what happens is two basic things. One is when they had a conflict with somebody and they decided just to up and leave because they're not going to resolve it, it makes for very awkward moments should you run into them somewhere because you never dealt with the conflict. And a second thing that I've seen that's a result of people that don't deal with conflict is that they have a habit of finding another place to go to and then inviting their friends out of the place that they're presently in and bringing them over with them and saying that, you know, I found the promised land and it's a lot better over here than it is over there. And so they invite people out to side with them because they never resolve their conflict as mature adults and as mature believers. And so what happens is instead of uh, unity being protected, disunity begins to, to occur. And so Paul, when Paul the apostle was writing, Paul would give commands to the church uh, in order that we might uh, be able to make an effort to maintain peace amongst ourselves. For example, in Ephesians 4, verse 3, Paul wrote that believers are to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He wrote to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 18, and he said to them, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And so we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and as much as lies within me, I make that effort. That's what we're supposed to do. So since conflict is inevitable, what can believers do to promote peace in the church? Now, as we've been going through Matthew, remember with me, we were in chapter 16, and in chapter 16, Jesus revealed to his disciples that he was the one who was building the church. The apostle Peter had made a confession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus spoke to him and had said to him, I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And so I'm going to build something called the Ecclesia, the church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against that. And so it's been pointed out that in the New Testament, the word church is used 110 times to refer to believers. It's a word that can be used to speak of believers throughout the world, speaking of church universal, but primarily the word is used to speak of local congregations or a group of local churches. That's why when you're looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 or 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Galatians chapter 1 or Galatians 1.22, you'll see that it speaks of churches, the churches of Asia, the churches of Macedonia, churches of Galatia, the churches of Judea. So the word can speak concerning a community of believers in a geographical uh, area, universal, if you will, but it also speaks of what would be called local congregations. And so it would speak concerning a group or groups of believers that are located in a community. It doesn't refer to a building. It refers to a congregation, an assembly of people. And the church, another basic thing, is made up of all people who have faith in Jesus Christ. We become part of the church when we're born again. So attending church services, we all know this, but I'm laying a foundation again. Attending church services does not mean that we're going to church by entering a building. It simply means that the body of Christ, the church, is assembled in a location. We, by one spirit, have been baptized into one body, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So the church exists not only universally, geographically, but also locally. And the local church, 
the church fellowship like we're in right now is spoken of very often in Scripture. Now, going a little bit further with that, laying some more foundation, the way that we enter into that church life is not by anything other than faith in Christ. We gave ourselves to God. By the Holy Spirit, God has convicted us. By the Word of God, He's explained to us. So as He's explained to us, this is how you become my child. The Holy Spirit has convicted us that that is true. And so we have believed in Christ as our Lord and Savior. Like it says in, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So Jesus Christ brings us into his church through faith in him. The church belongs to him. He purchased the church with his own blood. He purchased it when he died on the cross and poured out his blood for us. Acts 20, verse 28 says, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In whom, speaking of Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So, obviously, because he purchased the church, the church belongs to him, and we have been brought into his body. We have been bought, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.20, at a price. And he went on to say, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, which belong to God. So, you have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. He purchased you out of the marketplace of slavery, you, the Bible says, you and I, we were in, in, enslaved to sin. But Jesus Christ ransomed us. He did it by his blood. He purchased us. We heard the message of freedom and forgiveness in him, and we came to faith in him. We believed in him that he came, died on the cross, was buried, raised the third day. We've confessed to salvation these things, and now, because he purchased us, we belong to him. Now, because the church belongs to Jesus, we have certain responsibilities. One responsibility is to accurately represent the intentions of God, and the intent of God is that we be one in Him. You see, God intends to end hostility between God and man, and between man and man. And that, that hostility, there is a declaration of peace that has been given that will cause that hostility to cease, and the declaration of peace is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. So God has given a declaration of peace, and he's given to us terms of peace. Terms of peace found in the gospel would be unconditional surrender. That's what he calls us to. It's like when the United States was at war with the sovereign nation of Japan in World War II. And at the conclusion of that war, we were there on the Missouri, represented by Douglas MacArthur, and terms of peace were offered to the Japanese. And it wasn't a negotiated peace where they get this and we get that. It was unconditional surrender. The United States was regarding itself as the victor, and Japan was regarded as the vanquished. And so we can understand that when we think of war and hostility. The gospel is God's terms of peace. He is saying, I won, you didn't. You want a relationship with me? You surrender. And you don't negotiate your surrender, you unconditionally surrender. And that's called the gospel of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Give up. Yield to him. He owns you. Now, if you've done that, another thing about our God is that we know God is holy. And because God is holy, the children are like their parent. 
If God is holy, we too are to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, just as he called you as holy, so be holy in all you do. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Every father in this room understands what it means to, to when that baby is born, if you had the uh, ability to be in that room when the child is born. Every father in this room will understand this illustration. I, I, I did it four times when my four babies were born. How that the baby's born, they take the baby and put it in that little warmer there that you're used to putting tacos in. Then they bring that baby to you and you look at that baby. What are you looking for? Does it look like me? Better look like me. <laughs> we look for that in our kids. We look for something in our children that we can identify with. That's one of the things when you're raising kids, that's one of the things that helps you as you're raising your kids because you will see things in your kids that you recognize from yourself. You do, don't you? You're not always happy when you see that, but you see it. And that's what helps me and helped me to understand my kids. When my David would act in a certain way or Corinne or whomever would act in a certain way, very often I would see that sinfulness and I would recognize it. I'd say, oh man, you're like your mom, you know, and I would see that. <laughs> And I tell Marie, do better. No, you'd, you'd see yourself. You see yourself. And that's how you eventually stop worrying. Have you noticed that sometimes, if you're a parent, sometimes the kid that's most like you is the one you butt heads with the most? Have you noticed that? Yeah, because you see yourself. And, and you're going about it backwards instead of arguing them out of it. What you need to do is you need to learn to flow with that, knowing what would have helped you had it been done in your behalf, rather than arguing with them, you understand them. So what are you looking at? You're looking at the father in the child because there are earmarks, birthmarks. There are things about you that you see in them. Do you know that the Lord can, in a way, look at us and say, I am holy, therefore you be holy. Be like your father. Be like your father. God is holy. No, that doesn't mean we go out and construct our own holiness. It simply means that we fall in love with the holy God and become more like him because we're his child. We allow that goodness to come out because God has that within us. We simply begin to yield to the spirit, love the word, pray for obedience, and pursue him. And the Lord works in that way. It's, it's much more simple than we make it. God is holy. And so as a community of redeemed sinners, as much as we desire to do that which is pleasing to him, we will all still fall short of the glory of God. Yet, we've been called and equipped by God to live as those who have been saved. And so the quality of our lives, indeed, will be visibly different. Now, one of the things we resist is the temptation to become self-righteous like a Pharisee. We need to always be aware of our own failings, our own shortcomings. We need to guard ourselves against judgmentalism. We don't want to run around removing sawdust from a brother's eye while we have a two by four in our own. And yet, and here's the rub, we cannot ignore obvious sin either as if it's gonna go away. You see, if unrepentant sin is practiced in the church, it infects the life of the church. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, the Corinthian church had a real problem. It's interesting when you look and read and study 1 Corinthians, the first several verses of the chapter is filled with commendation. And then after around the eighth or ninth verse or so in 1 Corinthians chapter one, the rest of the book, 16 chapters, is correction. You have commendation in the introduction and correction for the rest of the chapters because there were so many problems that were in the Corinthian church. It's a great book to read. It's a great book for you to go and begin to read. And then you'll see what I'm speaking about. There's a lot of problems in the Corinthian church that Paul had to deal with. But it's interesting now, Paul made it very clear that it had been reported to him by the household of Chloe that there were problems. 
And so he begins to correct those problems. And one of the problems that he corrects is the fact that a man is having physical intimacy with his father's wife. And Paul says, and instead of you dealing with it and being humbled by it, you've actually begun to boast in it. He said, this is a sin that even the Gentiles are ashamed by, but not you. You think it's the grace of God to allow sin to continue. He said, you can't do that. He said in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. Deal with it, is what he's saying. You can't allow sin to fester there. It can't be leavened. It'll, it'll leaven the entire lump of dough. So this is what the Lord Jesus is actually speaking about and laying the foundation for, is something that we refer to today as church discipline. In effect, what it is, is to protect the unity of believers. And so we're going to look at a few things here in, uh, in Matthew 18, and we're going to see how Jesus presents five elements involved in godly disciplining of sinning members of the body. We're going to see the person who is to receive church discipline, the person who initiates church discipline, the purpose of church discipline, the process and place for it, and the proper authority for it. We're going to see that in these verses before us. So we'll begin where it says, where I, where I mentioned the person who is to receive church discipline. Notice verse 15. That was your introduction. Let's get into the passage. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. So we begin with the person receiving church discipline, your brother. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. So who is the person? Any Christian, male or female, who's part of the local community of believers in Christ. What he's dealing with is dealing, dealing with sin in the body of Christ. I'll say this very briefly, but it's important to say at this point. In today's current church life throughout this nation. In today's current church life throughout this nation, church discipline is almost a forgotten subject. When you study church discipline, I'll say it this way very briefly, there's basically two elements of what is called church discipline. One is called preventive. Preventive church discipline is simply the teaching of the Word of God. So if you're in a Bible study and the Word of God is being taught, that is called preventive discipline. What that means simply is this. It means that you're hearing the word of God and you're, through faith, receiving the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. You're being instructed by God's word. And so it's preventing you by obedience and faith. It's preventing you from getting to the second aspect. The second aspect is called correction or corrective. So preventive is intended to keep you from coming to corrective. Corrective is what Jesus is speaking about here. And he's speaking concerning people in the body of Christ who are professing believers. And he's saying that these people are to receive correction when they've sinned. Again, because there is a, an, there's an attitude, and I, I, I want to speak of it without coming off improperly or give you the wrong impression. It's difficult to do this and to make the point as clear as I would like it, we live in a time where the concept or the idea that a person actually calls a church their home, well, that home church, that def definition has, has changed. See, when I first got saved and I called Costa Mesa my home church, it's because that's where I went. Yes, I did attend other studies on occasion, but... My church was Calvary Chapel Coast Mesa. But today, one of my friends, for example, who was leading a ministry in another fellowship was wanting to put together the worship team and he, he had people come and they were filling out you know, their uh, application to be involved in. And he asked the question, is this your home church? And he said, Dave, you can't believe it. He said, the answers I get. He said, it's been more than once where someone will say, this is my home church on Sunday morning, but I have another home church on Sunday night, and I have another home church on a Wednesday night. 
He says they don't understand actually being rooted and grounded. They don't understand having a home fellowship because what they are is they're the church on wheels. They're nomads. They go to one church this day, and then two weeks later they're in that church that day, and then they argue by saying we're all the body of Christ. So they're never rooted, they're never grounded, they're never known, and if they should sin and confront it, they don't stay. They just move and take whatever it is that they've been doing, they take it someplace else. And so this kind of study is, is in many people's minds today an outdated study because they have taken the concept of the church and they don't understand what the church actually is. Because in their mind, the church is the church universal. You know, I can go to this church today and that church tomorrow, and nobody's saying you can't visit, but where are you rooted? And where are you planted? Where are you serving? Where are you giving? Where are you accountable? And many Christians, many Christians have no place that any of that's really taken place because they'll stay for a certain amount of time and go someplace else. Is that good for the church? No, not at all. Why? Because you can't hope to be able to build a ministry that actually reaches the unsaved when you have people who are part-time at best and not committed at all. And that's just a fact. And so when it comes to issues related to dealing with sin, well, people have a tendency of just walking out, saying, I don't need to hear this. I'm not part of that. It's interesting if you look at the book of Acts. Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He said that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In chapter 2, the 120 were up in an upper room. They were in an upper room when the day of Pentecost fully arrived. And the Holy Spirit fell upon the 120. They, began, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The church was birthed. They poured out of that upper room. And they began to speak with unlearned languages, magnifying and glorifying God. When people who were there for the Pentecost uh, season and festival heard these people, they began to mock them, saying, these people are filled with new wine. The apostle Peter stood up being filled with the Holy Spirit and said, these people are not filled with new wine. Uh, these people are not drunk as it seems. But these are those who have spoken of concerning uh, this event through the prophet Joel, who said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he explains what took place. He's saying the church has been birthed. The prophet uh, Joel had, had given word concerning this, and this is what you're seeing take place. No, they're not drunk with new wine, as you suppose. These are people who are actually baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're glorifying and magnifying God. So as you go through chapter 2, you get to verses 42 following to verse 47. And when you get to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it speaks about them continuing steadfastly, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the breaking of bread and in prayers, which gives to us the insight into the elements that made up the early church. And the first thing that is mentioned is that they remain constantly steadfast in teaching. It's interesting to note. I encourage you to do this. It doesn't take more than three minutes. You can do it when you go home. Just one thing. Look in the book of Romans, chapter 16, and start looking about uh, third down and see how many people the apostle Paul greets by name. He just goes on and on and on, all the way down, almost to the conclusion of the book. How could you do that, Paul? Because these people stuck around and we got to know them. And today, a lot of people don't and nobody knows them because they're not accountable. They have nobody that, that they can actually have an honest conversation with where they can say, pray for my soul. I'm going through a tough time at the job right now. They can't say there's somebody hitting on me or I'm hitting on somebody and I don't want to fall or I don't want to pursue this anymore. Pray for me. They don't do that. What they do is they keep it to themselves. They keep it secret. They don't say that when someone's gone and I've got my computer and it's on, it's just me and the, and the mouse there, and I go to this site. I don't want to do it anymore. They don't say that. They keep it to themselves because they're not accountable to anybody, because they don't know anybody, because when they're found out, they move someplace else. And yet, in church discipline, it is ordered to, it's in order to, to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and restore fallen brothers or sisters. That's what it's for. So there's an accountability. So somebody knows your heart, and they know your soul as far as you're willing to reveal to them. It's very important that we see that 
You see, in this particular case, as the Lord is speaking, this sin that he's speaking about is a sin that is a continuing sin. It's a sin that is, is unconfessed. It, it's a lifestyle of sin that's not consistent with Christian living. You see, for many, sinful living is so normal that the idea that it is not is almost foreign to them. Much has to do with the lack of Bible reading and Bible teaching and just misunderstanding. As I was driving here this morning, I, I have a Christian music station that I listen to. As I'm coming here, I'm listening to the music and we used to call him the disc jockey. I don't know what they're called now. The guy talking says, um, he said something like, if you're going, he said, it's Sunday. It's a day to worship and praise the Lord. If you're going to a church that does not say, neither do I condemn you, you're going to the wrong place. Now, he says that. And I listen to him. And then he goes on to spinning some more music and all that. But I turned the radio off. And I started thinking, because I'm one of these people who actually listens to what I'm being told. So I turned it off. And I started thinking about that. Is that right? Neither do I condemn you. How many of you recognize that phrase? Raise your hand. I want to know who I'm talking to. Neither do I. Let me tell you the story. Many of you don't know it. So I'll, I'll, you'll know it once I start saying it. You'll go, oh, yeah, of course. I understand that. Jesus is teaching. Some men bring a woman. Throw her down at the feet of Christ. Master. This woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Moses in the law says that such should be stoned. What do you say? And you know the story. How that Jesus bends down and begins to ride on, on the dirt and all. And how he stands up and he says, let the one who is without sin, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. You remember that story now, right? We all know it. And what happens? You know what happens. All the men who were holding these stones, just let them fall to the ground. From, the Bible says, beginning from the oldest to the youngest, they fade away until it's just the woman, Jesus, and maybe a few of his apostles and all. Woman, where are your accusers? I have none, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. We all know that, right? Do you remember what Alcee said? Go and sin no more. It isn't neither do I condemn you alone. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So yes, God's grace, God's mercy, God's compassion, we ought to walk out with that. Of course, go and sin no more is something we don't want to say today. Because if you stand up and say, go and sin no more, people say, you're judging me. Right? Am I wrong? I'm not wrong. No, Pastor David, you're not wrong. Thank you. <laughs> That's true. It's a fact. It's a fact. You're judging me. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Let's finish that. Go and sin no more. It's not that he's giving you permission to continue in sin. He didn't say, go back to the guy you were just sleeping with, the guy you just caught with. He didn't say that, did he? He said, I'm not going to condemn you. You see, they, they brought this woman based on Moses and the law. Moses in the law said, such should be stoned, is what they say to him. Well, yes, if you want to appeal to the law, where are your accusers? It takes two or three, according to the law of Deuteronomy. As a matter of fact, you'll see that again. It'll be repeated here in this, in this passage. It takes witnesses. You want to be judged according to the law? Where are, your, where are your accusers? I have none. Then the law, in this particular case, he didn't circumvent the law. He simply applied it. They want to apply the law? That's what the law says. But then he went beyond that. And he said, go and sin no more. I'm not giving you permission to continue in sin. I'm telling you to flee it, to get away from it. See, so what we have today is permission to sin, but nobody's saying, but go and sin no more. And the one who says, but go and sin no more. Oh, you're self-righteous. You're judging me. You're pointing your finger at me. No, no. Correction is brought in order that you might experience God. 
that you might, you might know him and that you might have fellowship with him and be used by him. And that's what the Lord is teaching us here. So if somebody is sitting continuously, it has to be dealt with. It, it cannot be allowed to fester. You see, the Bible makes it very clear that when we're really saved, we no longer long to sin. It's not that we won't sin, and it's not that we don't sin, but the lifestyle that we have is not going to be earmarked by unrepentant sin. People won't know us for the sin. They'll know us for the grace of God. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, John said it like this. He said, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. Because God's seed remains in him, he cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. Listen, you got saved. Maybe you got saved like I did. I was an alcoholic. I got saved. And when I get saved, I, uh, you know, I don't have a taste for alcohol. And one day, I go through, a, like I used to, I'd go in my ups and downs, and I was a new believer, and I I go through a, one of my downs, and the only way I knew how to deal with down times was to drink. So I drink. And after drinking, I wake up the next day, and I feel bad. I feel bad. I don't know what I'm feeling. I'm a new believer, but it's called conviction. You cannot sin. It's not that it's not possible for you to go out sin. You cannot sin without a sense of remorse and a desire to repent. Listen, the dog returns to the vomit and the pig returns to the mud because the dog is a dog and the pig is a pig. A believer might go back to the vomit, may go back to the mud, but can't stay there because they're not a pig and they're not a dog. They're a son of God. And so what happens is you're under conviction. And so that's what John is saying. You can't go back and continue sinning because there's no pleasure in anymore. God's Holy Spirit convicts you. So instead of ignoring sin, it is to be dealt with, and it should be dealt with quickly. Because if you allow it to continue, it, it gives it time to fester, and the person in sin can harden. In Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11, it simply says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And so if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. It's interesting, it doesn't say if your brother sins against you, go and tell everybody on Facebook. <laughs> tell him his fault. You speak to him about it. You see, the person who has had the problem initiates the restoration. He said if he sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So you deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. You take care of it in privacy. Because if you approach him lovingly and privately, they're more likely to repent. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says it like this. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. So the key to proper restoration is is instead of being proud, boastful, arrogant, and harsh, it, it, is, it is humility and it is a life that lives up to what you're telling somebody else. It's practicing what you preach. In Romans 15, verse 14, Paul said like this. He said, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Because you're good, and because you have knowledge, you're able. So it's living it out. Now, as you've come and you've spoken to this brother or sister and you've said, this is something going on I need to speak to you about, if he hears you, he says in verse 15, you have gained your brother. So the purpose of this is to restore somebody, to bring them to restoration. It's not to, it's not to get them thrown out of the church, it's to win them back to the Lord. But what happens if they won't listen? Verse 16. But if he'll not hear you, take with you one or two more that by the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And so what do you do? Well, you bring a witness. What you do is you bring a witness to help them. 
He didn't listen to you, so there are others who are aware of this and more than likely have been concerned over it. And if you're aware of some that are, well, you bring it, you bring them. You bring them along with you, and then that way you can say, bro, got to talk to you again. You didn't listen the first time. You're thinking I'm judging you. I've got another brother here, another one here, who, who want to share the same thing with you. And then they begin to share, listen, we're concerned for you, and that's what's supposed to take place. Now, as that is going on, and they're refusing to hear, and if they do refuse to hear, he says in verse 17, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. At that point, you bring in leadership in the church. You've already spoken personally. You've brought witnesses. And now you let the leadership of the church know. Now, it's interesting, once again, we're living in, a, in an interesting time, an interesting time in the history of the church where people feel bad about um, dealing with things like this. Read your Bible. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians in chapter 4, verse 2, actually calls out two members of the church, Iodia and Syntyche, two women. And he says, you've got to get along. He says that openly in the church. When you look in the book of Galatians in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul speaking in that portion, verses 11 through around verse 15, Paul there says that the Apostle Peter had done something that Paul himself had to confront him before witnesses. And so that's what the Apostle Paul did, and that's what he had to do. When he dealt with the problem in the church of Corinth, as I mentioned, he, he spoke concerning the household of Chloe, who have informed me. So he dealt with these kinds of things, and so you have to deal with it in order to preserve the holiness of the church and its testimony. And so leadership in church is, is not simply there to organize the church for activities, the leadership in the church actually adjudicates problems. Elders are to be able to teach the word of God as well as to enforce and exercise it. If you take notes, Hebrews 13 verse 7 says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. He goes on in verse 17 of the same chapter to say, Obey those who rule over you, be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Uh, not many people realize that a pastor teacher in the church has the authority to say, this is what the word of God says, we need to enforce it. Because a lot of times, if they don't like it, they just leave. They just take off. They don't want to hear it because they don't really care. And then they'll say, who are you to dominate my faith? Who gave you the right to do that? I still remember somebody many years ago, over 30 years ago now, who wrote me a letter telling me, you, my friend, are not Jesus. You didn't die for this church. He did. And I wrote back and I said, amen to that. Amen to that. Because if I were the ruler of the church, you'd be dead. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> but amen to that. But I've been given authority here in the church to exercise when it comes to matters of restoring those who have fallen and to bring correction. You see, if he refuses correction, how are you to treat them? So we'll put it like this. Somebody goes to another brother. We'll keep it in from man to man. Brother goes to another brother. Hey, bro, I got to tell you, I'm concerned for you because this, this, and that. The guy responds and says, that's, that's your opinion. That's so he says, no, this is what God's word says. It says this, this, and that. That's what you say. All right. He stays in that, brings a couple people. Bro, I have to just second what you've already been told. What you're doing is wrong. He says, that's what you guys say. You're all just against me. You know, you're just piling on. Now you're concerned. He's unrepentant. His leaven is spreading in the church. People are becoming aware of what he's doing. You now bring it to the leadership. The leadership approaches and says, listen, I've been told this. I'm concerned. Can I hear from you? Yeah, I'm doing that. So what? It's no big deal. Smoking a little pot isn't bad or whatever. And you say, well, bro, I have to be honest with you. This is word that God says related to our behavior and testimony. And this is, well, I don't really care. At that point, you treat them as a heathen in tax. Now, what is that? What's that mean? 
How do you treat heathens and tax collectors? Well, they're unsaved. So you love them. You don't, you don't judge them. You don't expect people who don't know God to act like Christians. But you don't welcome them in as members of the body of Christ either because they're not. They're heathens and tax gatherers. And so what you do is you give them the message of reconciliation and encourage them, but they're not to be back in that church, in that church fellowship, because they are unrepentant. And that's where people have their problems. And that's when people have been confronted. And in this church, we have on occasion had to exercise discipline like this. That's when they normally just float out the door and go someplace else because they don't want to be judged and you're being harsh. And that's when they begin to call their friends and say, they judged me. You ought to come over here. There's a lot of grace and mercy in this place. But that's not how it's supposed to happen. The reason that church discipline is enacted is to restore a fallen brother or sister. It's not a self-righteousness on the part of the individuals whatsoever. It's a desire to see them right with God. It isn't gracious to act as if someone is saved and not to be encouraged enough to encourage them to repent. And if they refuse to be corrected, you treat them as if they don't know the Lord. You treat them with love, but they're not to be treated as if they are still walking right with the Lord. No, Christians do not self-righteously judge, but we can't give a false assurance either. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy. Warn him as a brother. You see, non-Christians and biblically immature believers don't understand discipline. There was a, uh, just re this happened, this just happened recently. There was a, uh, a member of a Christian worship band who recently declared himself to be homosexual and was part of a, uh, of a band that was at a festival up north. And because he had declared himself to be rejecting what God's word says concerning that sin, he still went to this particular festival expecting to sing. The people who were working in the stage said to the one who organized the festival, this, brother's in, uh, this person's in unrepentant sin. And to have him come up and sing is to give a seal of approval on his sin. But the organizer felt bad because they didn't want to judge him. This just happened a couple weeks ago. He didn't want to judge him. And so there was another band playing who invited this guy, an unrepentant man, an unrepentant sinner, to come up and sing, thus giving a, a sense of recognition. And they said, well, that was the grace of God. So let me read to you Amos 5.23, where it says, Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. When you are mixing sin with worship, God said in the book of Amos, I don't receive it as worship because it's compromised and tainted by sin. And here we are, as Christians, saying, oh, let him sing, he's got so much talent. And the world sees that and says, there's no difference between you, who profess to know the Lord, and me, because we both accept sin. Now, we don't judge, and we don't condemn, and we don't treat with cruelty. We love, but we tell the truth, because it's the truth that sets you free. And it isn't true when you're lying to people. You got to understand that. You got, and a lot of people don't. And they say, oh, you're judging, you're harsh. No, we're just teaching God's word, which has been lost in this generation. People do not see the holiness of God. So as this is taking place, in conclusion, verse 18 and cl closing with verse 20, I'll summarize. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. 
So it's not speaking of agreeing in prayer, but agreeing in the enactment of discipline. And Jesus is revealing the proper authority to do this. The authority comes from him. He's saying, I am there in the midst of your decision as you bring discipline. When you sincerely and lovingly seek to maintain the purity of the body of Christ, you have my presence and my approval in your decision. And so that's how church discipline is to be enacted. Jesus' presence is there because his word of God is being enacted. And that's his presence there in that matter. God's word says this, we line up with it. Again, people say, well, who can line up perfectly? The answer is no, nobody. But he's not speaking about somebody who stumbles and falls. He's speaking about somebody who continues unrepentantly. And that is how church discipline is enacted. You see, it, it safeguards holiness within the church, according to Hebrews 12, 14, where he says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, and it protects the unity of the church. Rather than dividing, we are united in truth. Titus 3, 10 and 11, warn a divisive person once, warn him a second time, and after that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. What you do is you deal with it lovingly and firmly with the hope that the person who's being disciplined will say, I miss the fellowship I used to have. I miss my friends. I miss my walk with God. They never accepted my sin, though they have always loved me. I need to get right with God. And when that happens, you won your brother. He came back, and he can be used by the Lord again because he repented. Church discipline is something we don't talk about, but it's something that needs to be enacted.